I'm sure everyone's sick of me by now, but I come up with great guests each time, so this is really good. Well, we've heard a lot about the 8200 today, and now we have the 8200 panel. Um, first question, is there like a secret handshake that when you see one another, there's like a sign or something that you can tell you're, you're part of the, the mafia there? I mean, we could show him, then we'll have to kill him, right? That's yeah. the... What is this? Oh, you're telling me to end up killing me? All right. We'll see how the panel goes. I'll see if I want to do it. So let's start. I want to hear about this first. How did you all get into the 8200? What is the process? Is it you get tapped? Do you have to apply? Can you share anything? Uh, you, uh, you basically get recruited. Uh, they have a very specific uh, system from the age of 17 and up to go through a set of uh, uh, tests uh, and exams. Uh, and then basically at the end, you need to volunteer to the unit because most, uh, most of the roles require you signing for more than the mandatory three or four years. Uh, but by then, you are hooked completely through the process. And I think, I think talking about the, uh, the way people join 8200, probably this is the main, uh, the top secret component of, uh, of the unit, how they manage to build a very unique uh, machine, engine, of picking the right people, training them within three to six months. Uh, with, in other places, it takes years and then throwing them to the most uh, advanced and challenging uh, tasks. Uh, this, this is the, the real secret uh, of, of the unit, picking the right people and training them. Yeah, but really the unfortunate answer is that you can't choose to go. Like you can't apply, you can't really want to. You're, you get a tap. You get a tap, and is it, and do, do people, like, do teenagers, do they aspire it now? It's, it's almost like, oh, I want to go to this college. It's instead, I, I'm, I want to get into this unit. Is that a thing now? The are mothers there, there, uh, want that. Are there tutors to, like, teach them how to do it? Like, are there former, like, is it the test? Is it math-based? Is it like the SATs? How does this, this work? So it depends to which uh, area you're picked or tested. Um, I think the, the main component that they look for uh, and that's probably across the board, is for learning capabilities. Rather than what you know, or you, what's your training, or, or it's more of how fast you can learn, plus um, uh, how good you are in, team, in teamwork. I think these two components, uh, I've seen them across the board as the main uh, you know, prerequisites uh, for, for the unit. And the unit also uh, started to have all those activities primarily in the periphery uh, of uh, getting high school kids to kind of be trained, etc. That doesn't mean that they'll get uh, into the unit. They, w they still need to pass through the same, uh, same uh, tests and exams. Uh, but the unit starting from the age of 13 has all kinds of programs that, uh, to get them involved in, uh, in cyber and in things that potentially would be interesting later. But, but maybe one thing to say about do people want to, do teenagers want to go to the unit? I don't know, correct me if, if it was different for you, but when I was recruited, I don't know that I knew what 8200 was. Whereas today, you can't not know. So first of all, that it was a decision of the unit uh, to open the name. Yeah. I mean, I remember when, and again, I'm talking decades ago, uh, when I got recruited. A couple of years for me, not yeah. a... <laughs> Uh, when I got recruited, it was, there were two kind of leading programs. One was Talpiot that belonged to the Air Force, and we were called uh, Intelligence Talpiot. Uh, and no one knew what, what that was. Uh, no one was allowed to say the, the number 8200. And then probably 15, 20 years ago, the unit decided to start combating the uh, propaganda or the marketing that uh, Talpiot did, and that they need to brand so that they can, uh, get, they can get uh, that competition on talent uh, with the Air Force. Yeah, actually, if, if I'm not mistaken, for you as well as for me, the first training, the basic training, in the first few months, we didn't even know what we were supposed to do. So we were tr like, you know, getting general training. And that's after then signing then for two more years to do something, we had no exactly. idea what we're going to do. <laughs> that's right. And it, we, it's, I mean, we've had, I think, half the people on the stage have been alumni, today have been alumni of A200. What is the, the secret? What's the trick that you know, you've created, this unit has created so many, not just great technologists, but incredible leaders, 
entrepreneurs? Like, I want to hear what is that DNA? Is it the people going into it, or is it the machine they're coming out of? A little bit of both. I'm fascinated by that. It's clearly both. I mean, it's clearly the type of people who go in and what the system does with them once they're in there. But I think, and we discussed this earlier outside, and that you take people who are intelligent and driven and ambitious, and you give them a set of problems, and you say, go do. And so they do. And they do it collaboratively, which is probably key, right? Because you can't not be a team player in that setting. And you have to be creative. And there is a lot of stress and a lot of pressure and sometimes very important things at stake. So you do. And the other component is, you know, at this age, the average age is what, 20 or, or 18, anything between that. Uh, people don't necessarily know that what they're trying to do is impossible. And then eventually they are able to do the impossible just because they don't have this legacy that we have today. Uh, from experience, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's limiting. And I think this is part of the uh, secret as well. I mean, so much entrepreneurship is about thinking big, dreaming big, and you have you know, young, smart, and maybe powerfully naive you know, people, right. and then they, no one's told them that it's, they can't do it. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and, and no one indoctrinated them on, on how to do things. So all those courses are basically teaching them skills and teaching them capabilities, but without this is how we tackle problems, etc. So think about uh, how you do it. Uh, at uh, universities, at Harvard, etc. That's kind of a playbook. This is how we tackle things. That's not how teaching it uh, at the unit works. It's like uh, some some examples of what what worked before, but primarily just giving you skills and uh, and tools to tackle things that you and, and you get used to working on things that you don't you're not sure you have, you don't have a clue how to start and you're not sure how to tackle them. And that, I think, later makes a uh, problem in real life, in uh, entrepreneurships, much, much easier. And you, know, y you both run companies. You m invest and mentor your portfolio companies. How do you take, like, distill the, you know, the skills you learned in the, in the unit, in the service, um, to run your companies, but also to um, you know, mentor and teach you know, employees, uh, portfolio companies? Like, how, what are the, the key takeaways? I know it's you spent you spent a whole career in there, but like what when you try to mentor people and raise up talent, what what kind of tricks from the 8200 do you bring to your portfolio to your companies? I have to answer this because I had a commander, uh, Mir Dagan. You guys know him, um, and I remember he, him telling me it was the first day of the training that was 20 something years ago. And he said, you don't need to know anything, but you have to know where to find the answers. And it's, you know, it's something people say, but it's stuck. And I think that's how I spent my entire career. That's why I, that's the thing that I leave to, to my mentees, to the CEOs that I work with. You don't have to know the answers, but you have to be that guy that knows where to get the answers from. So Google? Well. <laughs> Well. Google too. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it's, it's that mindset. Right? You have to keep on hitting that wall and figure. It's it a out. mindset saying you can't not know. You will know. You will find the answer. The the other component, I think, it's hard to teach that, but it's something you get to learn in the unit. For sure, if you are there 23 years as, as I was, resiliency. I think this is a key component in in in, in startups nowadays, and you know. Resilience is, is, is a lot of things, but I think in this specific case, being able to um, prevail or to continue despite the pressure and despite the failures and mistakes and embracing mistakes um, and uh, you know, uh, bouncing back from, from failures. Um, this is something that you get to learn, you get a perspective once, once you, you, you know, you're involved in this kind of activity for so many years uh, in the unit where you work under pressure with super important things um, and fail time and again until you manage to, to do what you need to do. Uh, this type of a training is essential, and I think you see that across the board in, in, in the industry in Israel. Resilience is the main component for, uh, for startups.
Very cool. Katie, what do you... What do you I was just going to add, I mean, you were in a role that uh, you had to know the answers. I was in a place that we knew that there's no answer and we need to find it. And in terms of uh, people, and people in the, you're, they're building all the time, right? Some units are building product software and stuff. And so much of you know, the stuff we enjoy now um, has been kind of commercialized. Like, do people, how do I, if you're in the unit and you invent something, do you own that? Can you then take that out if it's safe? Or how does, how does that, or they, how does that work? Or in terms of, you know, things that may be inspired by there and then turn that into a commercial startup? What, what is, how does that work? I think you know when when we pick the uh, people to join the unit, one of the kind of uh, uh, unwritten agreements, um, and and they come from from mutual respect, and I think a core essence of value, is that you don't take the secrets outside the unit, uh, and the uh, you know and the specific knowledge that you have, and you don't use it outside, and the unit, even though it's challenging, has been able to do that uh, for so many years. Um, what you do take is the experience. Is, for example, in my case, in cybersecurity, you take the perspective on, of an attacker. Being an attacker for so many years yeah. gives me, uh, you know, um, a different perspective on how to uh, to protect uh, from cyber attacks. But that's an approach. That's a state of mind. It's not a specific knowledge that you take from from the unit. You never do that. Yeah. And I would say more than this. I think that the unit started, I mean, alumni of the, uh, of the unit started startups 30 years ago. Uh, there was no cyber back then. Uh, so the, and what the unit did, did back then had nothing to do with the startup that came out of that. So again, going back, uh, Converse uh, started as one of the major uh, companies here back in early 90s, had nothing to do with what, uh, what the guys did uh, in, uh, in the military service. And I think that only, say, 15 years ago, cyber started and now there is some correlation between what's, uh, what the unit does and what the company do. But again, uh, there's an unwritten agreement that you, n you do not take capabilities and uh, commercialize them outside. Gotcha, that's smart. Int and it's, it's, what strikes me is the 8200 is also the community. Um, I just did a panel before and Asaf was saying that you know, all his founders are from his unit. You know, you, you know Yuri from, from Waze and stuff. Talk to me about how important that community is, um, you know, in the unit, when you go out to entrepreneurship, I'm sure, I wonder if you, I with your investing pipeline and everything, I wanna hear about the power of that because, you know, we have a great under 30 community here and hopefully people will be friends for a long time, doing business, helping, advice, partnering. Is there like a alumni network? And I wanna hear about the power of that. So first of all, there's a huge alumni uh, network, which is extremely powerful in Israel, but and, and we can talk about that, about the different uh, foundations and accelerators that have can come out of it. But think about how communities are formed. They're formed out of mutual experiences. And here you have a group of people, a relatively large group of people, that is, that is going through some very, very forming and meaningful experiences. Time pressure, pressure, very intense, a very long time tackling ton of problems, failing together, succeeding together, that forms a bond that is very, very strong. Some of my best friends and some of my strongest colleagues are people from the unit who I've served with or have somehow been related to, uh, to my time in the unit. And it's, it's a bond that's difficult to break. Okay. And I would add at that t time also, this close network of friends are the only friends that you actually discuss the most important thing that you were doing in your life at that point, okay? So that they are kind of the close network to you, the only ones that you can talk about, uh, about the projects, the failures, etc. So that creates very intense uh, three years to five years or 23 years of working with those people and then you continue with the, with the relations afterwards. And maybe the other component of, uh, of the network is the fact that they have similar heritage or, or history. You know, even though uh, we didn't serve in the t same time, I, we share the same stories, um, you know, the, the same, uh, you know, forefathers of, of our unit and the same, uh, you know, uh, stories of great success or great failures. And, um, and so I think having the same narrative or a shared narrative is also certain, a component of a, of a network that makes it strong. And when you go to, when you're building companies or like do you, when you in interviewing an investor, like if they're uh, an alumni, is that like a, a, like an extra feather in their cap, so to speak, and so with hiring and that thing? 
I want to say it isn't, but in some sense, sometimes it is. And funny enough, when entrepreneurs represent, uh, introduce themselves, they always say a word about what they did in the military. Uh, and you know, when someone served, for me, it's easy to say, oh, really? What did you do? And I can attribute things to that. But it's not to say that there aren't phenomenal entrepreneurs who served in other units or didn't serve at all. Uh, there is some sense of familiarity in it, but that's it. Yeah, I think it's, I, you know, to people that are outside of Israel, you know, sometimes we compare H200 to the NSA because it's the same role and the same responsibility as an organization. But actually, I think that it's more precise to say it's, it's like the Ivy League university or college in, in, the, in the U.S. in the sense that, um, you know, it gives you a... a uh, Credentials. Kind of, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. A stamp of a... a stamp, exactly, that's it, and the network. Um, I think that uh, is more, more relevant in, in this specific context. Yeah, we talked about backstage, like, you know, most big, most countries have, you know, an intelligence unit, they have high-tech unit, whether it's America, the UK, China, Russia, you name it. But no place has this, you know, track record of just amazing founders and technologists coming out. What, how do you explain that versus, say, America or Germany or the UK? So if you look at the average you know, uh, uh, person serving in the NSA compared to the, uh, in the GCHQ, which is the equivalent in, in the UK, compared to H200, uh, here they are younger, uh, less, ex less experienced, uh, with no formal training. Um, and, and that creates a different prototype of, uh, of, of you know, who the person is, uh, their approach, and, and, and what they do after they, they have this military service. This is one component, I think. We discussed some others. I, I think you could look at that as basically the state of Israel is a huge HR function where the kids are uh, between 17 and 18, and they recruit the best two specific units, okay? And then uh, those units actually then augment their capabilities. And then that stamp of approval that you got, you were in this course, you were in 8200, you were, and again, there are many, many uh, units like that. That's basically leveraging this HR process, that uh, screening process of, and just imagine if you, as an HR, HR of a company, you could uh, screen any 18 year, years old yeah. in, the, in the country and eventually also pay him 200 bucks, that's, uh, that's nice. You know, we have a room full of entrepreneurs here um, you know, all across the board, all across the country, uh, sorry, all across the world. What kind of, if you could distill some knowledge that you've learned through your training, through your experiences, and you know, said like, this is live or die, you know, wartime stuff. Like, what advice would you give this room of people um, if there was kind of a, you know, little, you know, checklist of, you know, maybe it's mindset or just tips or just, you know, how they can translate what you were trained on, you said this HR component, this you know, state you know, machine to these, these startups. I would pick other than, we discussed already the resiliency, I would pick three components maybe. One of them is, is uh, uh, the ability to focus um, and, and to concentrate your energy or, or your team's energy on a very uh, focused area, of a very focused problem and, and, and you know, uh, uh, doing whatever you need to to solve that. Um, this is one one you know kind of a uh, capability that you build in the unit. Um, and, and the other one, and I leave the third for the rest of the guys yeah. here. The other one is uh, the close loop of uh, of trial and error, feedback, um, and improve. You know, try fit, get feedback and improve. This is something that a unit. Um, uh, is constantly living in this loop of, you know, a new tool, a new capability. You use it in the field. Uh, you get the feedback within hours and days, and then you improve. This cycle of being uh, always attentive to what the customers, uh, uh, the market is saying, and then changing what you need to, to, to be successful, this is uh, something so that's constant training. experimentation, constant trial like and error. Testing, exactly. trial. Yeah, yeah. I think it's two things for me. One is a red team. Sorry, is what? Red team what's, competitive what's intelligence, okay. which is something that you know we tune on uh, in the unit, understanding but really understanding how the other side thinks. And the other has to do, and we talked about that, 
failure. It's okay to fail. You don't do, you don't succeed, you won't fail, but then you won't achieve anything. And I think that it's something that in the unit, at least in my days, was a thing. That it's okay to fail, we'll investigate it, we'll learn from it. Today in corporates, you see a lot of people who are, you know, who are, who are very, um, uh, who are very senior because they've never made any mistakes. They're survivors, right? They're survivors. You can't be a survivor in the unit. So those are probably my two. A quick question. I just want to. I want to hear. I just want to follow up on that. Understanding what the competition or what the other side thinks. How is that done? In the unit. In the unit, or maybe in real. In the unit, yes, but also, how do you then translate that to civilian life? Same thing with the handshake. We'll need to kill him after okay. that. Okay, all right. I, I, I want to I eat lunch, so I'm not going to get killed yet. Um, okay, then how do you take those lessons in the, in the real world as a civilian, as an investor, in terms of you know, thinking what the opposition thinks? It's how you put yourself in, in the shoes of your opponent. It's a mindset. And I'll add to, I think the secret sauce is that, uh, and what can be taken is this the notion that uh, uh, you can't assume that uh, something is impossible. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, connect to Uri's uh, company, okay, Waze. Uh, the guy, El Chabtai, the guy that started that, the technical guy, basically sat on his balcony and started to code uh, a system that if you would ask any consulting firm, they would say that it needs 200 people for 10 years to, uh, to create that. I mean, uh, he was building on the fly maps when, uh, when maps were done by aerial photography and, uh, and sending crews. Uh, and, and the whole notion of, uh, or the chutzpah to even uh, sit and, oh, let, let, let me just try that for a couple of months. And he did that in four months, by the way. Wow. That's the spirit of just everything is possible if you just start doing this. I think chutzpah is a perfect way to end this. Um, I want to thank our amazing panel for giving us a little insight, not too dangerous, but I appreciate that. And thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.